All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BX Just Weekly, episode eighty-four, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And this is another one of those weeks where we, well, barely have anything really. Um, so yeah, it's going to be relatively short. There are some really cool things um, this week around, so you know, stick around and uh, listen. Hey, Kepler, welcome to the stream. Okay, so as usual, um, we're getting started with the beginner section. The three articles we have here today is the beginner's guide to chart.js, a very nice introduction to a pretty neat charting library that uh, talks about using it. Um, yeah, basically, you know, the tutorial for it. So exactly what you would expect. If you are getting started with charts, and you were looking for a nice library, do check this one out. It's actually quite good. I'm currently using it in a project. I think I've used it like one or two and it was uh, pretty nice. There is also wrappers for pretty much any frameworks over there. So um, yeah. Uh, hey, Talbzis, welcome to the stream. And thank you so much for the subscription three months in a row, man, this is holy shit. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm really flattered. Thank you, man. Okay, um, continuing the next article we got here is react hooks. Oops, part two. Why does my effect uh, run multiple times with the same dependencies? So there's this um, thing about the use effect hooks, uh, right, which takes in dependencies as the second uh, parameter. And a lot, of, a lot of times people misunderstand the way it works, right? So if you uh, work with react for a long time, you know that the um, shoot component update pretty much or no, rather not the shoot component to date, but the react, um, what was it called react basic component? What was it react components? Um, what is it called? There's the react component. And then there's this react basic component or whatever it's called. Uh, shallow render, there we go. No, that's the shallow render itself. What was the name of it? Come on, I know I know I remember it sometimes. Um, react, God damn it the component that basically tests uh, shoot component update with just basic comparison, there was the name for I don't did they deprecate it. So there's the shoot component update, right? And it's used for performance pure component there we God damn it, there we go. This is what I was looking for. <laughs> so you got the react pure component, right, which just does stupid shoot component update, and it compares the previous properties with the next properties. And if they don't match in a naive comparison, it will basically update, right? So that means that if you have properties that are objects, it will always update. The same caveat applies to the use effect because it does the shallow like the basic comparison to the dependencies. So if those dependencies contain an object, and that is a new object every time it will re render and trigger use effect every time, right? Um, second parameter is not kind of like it's not observer, it's more like a memoization based on the second parameter. So you know that you pass the value here. And if that value is the same as a previous time, the hook will not run. This is kind of the point of it. If you want more details, read through the article, it does a very good job of uh, basically explaining all of that and showing off uh, why exactly you should keep the dependencies array to simple values, because it's easier to compare. There's also actually custom hooks that uh, do like the deep comparisons for objects and arrays. Uh, if you're curious, I think the author here mentions them. But uh, it's a very straightforward topic, which might confuse some people at first. Uh, so if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Okay. And the last article we got here today in the getting started section is the ultimate guide to Next.js authentication with aus zero. So this is obviously from aus zero blog. So you know, as you might expect, Mostly the write up is related to their tech. But the cool thing is that you know, their server is not the only authentication server that you can use. So you can apply well majority of what's written in this article uh, to Next.js apps with any other authentication server, which is um, other than that, you know, the write up is actually really good, really detailed. So if you are building an Next.js app, and you wanted to build an authentication with a third party auth server, be it auth zero or you know, whatever else, then this is a really good write up. So I would highly recommend going through as usual, you know, as they tend their article tend to be is very lengthy, very big and very detailed, which is a pretty good thing. All right, that is it for the getting started section. As I mentioned before, not really that many things this week around. But uh, yeah, so articles and news section, we got some pretty cool things here today. So the first one is 
JavaScript Brawl-like tutorial. So this is uh, exactly as it says, a very detailed tutorial on making your own Brawl-like. There is an example of completed game, uh, completed game over here that looks like this. So you know your typical roguelite with some uh, enemies and stuff. Pick up the gems, then go to exit and try not to die. And I died in the first level. That's great. Um, but yes, you know. So this is what it looks like. There is a pretty detailed uh, tutorial guiding you step by step, starting from you know drawing on the canvas going to the map generation, monsters, game uh, life cycle, treasures, and all that kind of stuff. It's actually really good. So if you're interested in game dev and wanted to make your own uh, roguelike or more specifically broglike, then do check this one out. It's actually really good. Okay, next one we got here is the service workers at TPAC. So this is a really lengthy write up on uh, well, everything that happened related to service workers at W3C uh, TPAC conference, uh, I think like September or something. So basically recently, you know, and there is a ton of changes that are planned or coming to service workers, uh, improvements, other stuff. It is crazy. Like I didn't know there's so much work actually going in them. I kind of thought they were, you know, more or less done because I personally never like I don't think I've used them like once or twice, but I never relied on them too much. So I'm kind of disconnected from the area. And in my opinion, I was like, you know, it does what it's supposed to do. So I guess I don't really need them. But turns out there's like a ton of work being going on there. And um, it's absolutely fascinating to read about that. Uh, hey, Xstorm, welcome to the stream. Uh, so yes, coming back to the article, if you are interested in service workers, if you are working with them heavily, if you are, you know, doing progressive web apps, and you want to go offline and stuff like this, then absolutely do read through this. There's some very interesting stuff in here. Um, hey, Viable Clan member, uh, service worker versus web worker, uh, web worker. So web workers is basically like a stream, right? Or like, um, yeah, like a stream, right? So you can basically create a new, um, not a stream, what, I want, what I'm saying, not a stream, the thread is what I want to say. So web worker is kind of like a thread, you can create a new web worker, yes, and it does work in the background, right? So in a separate thread. Service worker is that thing that lives inside of your app as a separate thing. And that can handle, for example, offline requests, it can intercept the fetch request, it can preload the resources, do the updates in the background and stuff like this. So it's sort of this uh, background service that augments your web application and makes it more smart. Um, you can make coffee with it if you have a coffee machine that has API. So you know, that's, that's a viable thing. <laughs> But okay, yes, um, then again, you know, sum summarizing the article, if you are working with service workers, make sure to check it out. There is a ton of very interesting information here. Okay. And the last thing we got here for the article section is uh, letting web app users run multi module JavaScript code. This is a pretty interesting write up on essentially allowing your users to compile the code directly in the browser and executing it in place. Uh, in this case, um, using rollup to do that. And uh, it is, I, you know, you would think it's very easy, right? Just give a few input fields and then roll them up into a bundle and then just run it in the browser, right? It seems straightforward, but uh, there's actually a ton of intricacies involved and a bunch of uh, modifications that you have to make to your loaders to actually make that stuff properly compile, which is uh, quite fascinating. So if you're working on an app that needs to allow users to execute their codes, then do check this one out. It's actually a very interesting write up, um, you know, including a bunch of other things like WebAssembly integration and stuff like this. Um, quite, quite enlightening, to be honest. But yeah, um, there we go. This is actually it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks and bit sized awesomeness. The first uh, tiny article we got here is the today I learned the power of JSON stringify replacer parameters. And this touches on the uh, second parameter of JSON stringify function that um, actually, until I read this article, I didn't even know about that, you know, the fact that it existed. But turns out when you do JSON stringify, and I looked it up, JSON parse also takes a second parameter, you can pass a second parameter, that is a function that can uh, modify the uh, object or if it's JSON parse, the string during the parsing. So you can actually create custom output for JSON stringify or JSON parse, 
by modifying the values in place. So the function takes the key value and it will be executed on each uh, basically value in an object and you can do whatever you want, right? So in this case, the example is uh, stringifying the set as a basic array, which I think you don't actually have to, I don't, I don't know, does it? I think it should stringify as an array, but I might be wrong here because I never had to stringify sets so far. But uh, yeah, there you go. So it's a pretty neat little trick and you can do the same with JSON parse and um, it seems pretty, pretty handy. So like in some cases it could be very handy, especially if you have custom data structures that you have to stringify and cannot do the, you know, override the two string method, for example. Right, um, next thing we got here is top level await. Uh, this is a write up on V8 dev log. Um, so top level await has finally landed in the master branch for V8. I believe it's still behind the flag in all the latest versions. I'm not even sure if it's available in beta, it's probably just in a dev or canary. But this is essentially a write up on how the await syntax on the top level now works what you can expect from it. And also the interesting thing I found it is they address the, you know, top level of eight, isn't it a foot gun? And no, not really. So there are caveats that you have to keep in mind, but it's actually quite good. So if you're interested in top level of weight and how it will work, do check this one out. It's actually a really good write-up. Okay. Next thing we got here is the sort of a PSA public service announcement. If you are using LastPass extension for Chrome, it might slow down your browser by about 50%, specifically the DOM interactions. Um, I've tried it myself. I've used LastPass until sometime and uh, I guess like a few months ago and um, I mean, it worked okay, right? But uh, I got annoyed by it at some point and switched to the Bitwarden that is a lot snappier, faster, nicer and open source as well. But yeah, so the last pass um, is basically injecting about 850 kilobyte worth of content scripts on every page, which means that all of your DOM interactions will be about 50% slower depending on your machine and depending on the page in question. So in this case, you can go ahead and write, um, run the speedometer in your browser to see the difference, but it is mind blowingly bad. Uh, just to note, you know, I'm using Bitwarden and Bitwarden has zero impact on the DOM performance. So um, might be a good idea to switch. Again, it's open source and you can self-host. Um, I don't believe it is possible to disable the, do it is possible to disable, is it? Did they add a flag for that? May I mean, it's, I know that it's dis enabled by default and it's very annoying basically, but um, yeah, if it's possible to disable and it might be not too bad. Um, but again, I do prefer open source and auditable software to the closed stuff, you know, and uh, log me in owning LastPass does not um, actually inspire confidence. So yeah, I'll just stick with Bitwarden for now. <laughs> but anyway, you know, here's your PSA. So if you're using LastPass, just make sure to look into all of that. There is uh, quite a bunch of useful comments here in the thread as well. Okay. Continuing, we got an introducing create next app. This is an announcement from the Next.js guys. So they just uh, um, launched the create next app that basically scaffolds the Next.js application for you with all the best practices, offline supports, uh, default project templates and bunch of other stuff. So if you're working with Next.js and you have to scaffold stuff a lot, then this might be very helpful for you. So there we go. Okay, um, is Bonzi Buddy okay? I don't know what, it, what is Bonzi Buddy? This is the first time I've heard about the, what is this? Software, uh, the, <laughs> what is this? Okay, you know what? I'm not gonna spend time on that. So let's, <laughs> let's just continue. Right, um, so the next announcement we got here is from the Google. Um, and this is, uh, Grasshopper, so this is a software that they've actually launched quite a few years ago, if I remember correctly. And it basically allows you to learn how to program, including JavaScript. Um, at first they only launched it for some reason on mobiles and tablets, which was a weird decision in my opinion. But now they're finally announcing that you can go through it uh, in browser. So you can now go to the Grasshopper website uh, right here you can click start coding today. And for some reason, uh, for me, I cannot sign in with Google. So I just click on it. It loads the sign in window and then just does nothing. I have no idea why that happens, but if that works for you, you can start coding um, right away in the browser and learning JavaScript. And from what I've heard, the tutorials there are actually pretty damn good. So there we go. 
Okay, um, that is it for the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. Uh, let me have a look at the chat. Uh, what do we have here? Is this ad design thing? Um, okay, what is happening? My uh, browser. So I remember seeing ad design some time ago, and uh, for some. Re oh, oh, okay. They've made an editor. That is fancy. Okay, I have not seen that. Um, I will copy this link. Thank you very much for sharing. And I will um, I will definitely cover this link. Uh, let me think. I need a telegram. I will definitely cover this link on the next podcast. That actually looks really fancy. And export JSX. That is awesome. Is there a preview button somewhere? How do you export it? Um, download preview. So you can even do preview directly here. And uh, is there the save source codes, edit data. You can even provide your own data in JSON. That is really cool. Okay, thank you for sharing. This is pretty awesome. Like this is a very nice looking tool. Is it? I wonder if it's it's probably open source as well, right? Because N Design itself is open source too, and it's in Chinese. I sure as hell hope there is English somewhere. Maybe it's not yet translated. But okay, I will have a look later. So thank you very much for sharing. That actually looks really cool. Uh, okay, not yet, but it's fine. You know, as long as the source is open, I think we could figure out how it works. Uh, but anyway, continuing, we got the releases of this week section. The first major release is uh, VS Code version 139, the September release. There's already been some minor uh, releases to patch some bugs, but um, yeah, so the Release is mostly UI UX uh, changes, stuff like text selection now displayed in minimaps. You can now toggle region folding using keyboard shortcuts. And there's a bunch of other minor changes that are, well, some people were really excited about them. Uh, yeah, you also now have the MDN reference and um, the tr you can just trust domains instead of uh, VS Code asking you all the time if you really want to open this link, which annoyed me to no extent. <laughs> which is, yeah, so some pretty good uh, UX changes. Make sure to update if you're using it. If not, then, well, give it a shot. VS Code is literally my favorite editor, so there we go. Next release we got here is Next.js version 9.1, adding support for public directory, finally. So you can just, you know, publicly, statically mount your stuff and it won't be compiled. It will be just mounted at the root of your application. Very handy for stuff like fab icons. And it also now has support for the source directory where, which means you can nest your pages there under the source here to support a wider variety of application setups, as they say. So yeah, just, you know, tiny handy stuff. And there's also a bunch of uh, preview features that you have to toggle with a special flag in the config, uh, stuff like built-in CSS support, which is finally, let me just say that. It's like, I'm still amazed it took them so long to add it by default because... <laughs> Like, come on, it's CSS, right? Uh, module, no module splitting, which will be automatic, which is absolutely awesome. Again, this is just a preview feature, but it's coming there. And other stuff like improved bundling, uh, splitting and uh, static error pages. So uh, yeah, looks pretty fancy. So if you're using Next.js, good news, do try it out. This looks pretty damn exciting. Uh, I find PHP Storm is more pro. Um, I mean, WebStorm, PHP Storm, and all that stuff is good, and they do have some pretty fancy heuristics in there, but it is heavy as hell. Like, seriously, the Electron based VS Code works faster than the WebStorm, so yeah. Uh, what is all the MGS versus Node.js? I mean, there's no longer MGS versus Node.js debacle, right? So Node.js will have MGS and the ES modules will work with MGS and without it actually, which is quite good. Um, we just have to wait a few more months, I guess, until we get it shipped in the um, release basically. Okay. Continuing with the releases, we got a uh, final one of the week. This is React Hooks version 1.4.0. It adds the hooks for use viewports, uh, scale, scroll coordinates, and size. The viewport thing we talked about that was just added finally to Safari on iOS. So you can actually properly detect the size of the screen. So yes, uh, if you are using hooks, make sure to check this one out. Seems to be quite nice. Right, that is it for the releases. Let me have a quick look in the chat. It's very lively this time around for some reason, even though the podcast is super tiny. Okay, I try every two months, VS Code feels like a toy. Um, now here's the thing, VS Code by default is indeed very limited, but once you add a bunch of plugins, including the official ones from the Microsoft, it becomes incredibly powerful. And the way that the TypeScript is basically ingrained into VS Code itself, 
And the way the VS Code utilizes TypeScript to give you the JavaScript suggestions is, in my opinion, a lot better than at least what I tried in the WebStorm about a year ago. I guess maybe WebStorm at this point is already improved, but I, yeah, you know what? WebStorm costs money, VS Code don't, and I, I take open source over the proprietary any time of the day. So there you go. Um, okay, um, anyway, continuing, we got the libraries and demos. Uh, not that many um, either here, but uh, the first one we got here today is Cropper.js, a very fancy Cropper plugin that allows you to crop images, preview the changes dynamically, as well as do all of that. Uh, whoops, I am doing the wrong thing. Do all of that programmatically, like, you know, move the image, zoom, rotate, flip, scale, whatever the hell you can imagine, and all of that with the live previews, that looks pretty damn good. Uh, so if you're looking for the image cropper, do check this one out. Um, same for polygons. What do you mean for polygons? Like what, what, what kind of, like this cropper works on the canvas JS. So theoretically you can just render anything you want into canvas, including WebGL if you want to. Uh, oh, you mean, okay, not rectangle. That's a good question. I, yeah, it says this one seems to just, work with rectangles, but uh, I think it should not be too hard to patch it to work with, there's even a photo editor here, wait a second. Whoops, that is U matrix, that is not what I want. Browse or drop, um, sure, let's drop one of those things. And okay, so this is more advanced version of it. I mean, I guess you could just patch it to work with random shapes because it shouldn't be too hard, right? So it's like, okay, the rectangle is obviously the easiest one, but it's open source. You can just go to the GitHub fork it and then add the different selection methods. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's just rendered in canvas and you get the outputs as the slices of canvas. This is how it does previews. Most likely I haven't looked at the source code to be honest, but this is what I would personally do. Uh, preview, let me just check. So I'm guessing it just cuts the canvas and then does the uh, blob URL and just renders it into the um, set data. Yeah, yeah, it looks like it, this is exactly what happens. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so it shouldn't be too hard to modify it to use the custom uh, polygon shaped crop out whatever form. Also, you know, it's a, it's a very specific use case. So you might be better off creating your own version of that. Uh, but anyway, continuing, we got raw VASM, a really cool um, repository containing the WebAssembly demos that are written by hand. All of them are super tiny. There is a bunch of them. I think the most impressive uh, I saw was the maze. So it's a Wolfenstein 3D maze, uh, Wolfenstein style 3D maze um, that is comes with a timer. So you can you know measure how fast you can go through it. All of it in 200 and uh, 2000. 184 bytes. This is like, just look at this demo. And now this is, this is just, um, I think, yeah, so you use the arrow keys. 2,184 bytes. And I already go in the wrong way. Um, this is probably wrong as well. So just, yeah, this is handwritten and absolutely insane. So if that sounds interesting, if you have any interest in WebAssembly, do check it out. It seems like a really cool learning material. And can I actually find an exit? This looks like an exit, right? There we go. I actually completed it in 26 seconds. Not too shabby. <laughs> okay, continuing, we got is website vulnerable? A command line utility that scans the given website for the uh, libraries it uses, detects the version, and then shows you the publicly known vulnerabilities for these libraries. Could be useful, but then again, take all of those vulnerabilities with a grain of salt because this there's this exact same problem with the GitHub now that basically tells you that your libraries is vulnerable because the tool here cannot know if you are using the specific feature of the library that is vulnerable, right? So it can be extremely helpful, but it can be also um, basically trigger the false positives, right? So make sure to double check and make sure you actually use the code that is vulnerable and it's not just, you know, false positive. Uh, what game designer uses keys for W? I mean, it's maybe he's not game designer. It's just a labyrinth, right? So it might not, it, it's not technically a game. So there you go, right? <laughs> Continuing, we got uh, Ferrum from Adobe, uh, features from Rust language in JavaScript, 
provides trades, type classes, and advanced library for working with sequences, iterators, in JavaScript. Now, a uh, majority of this stuff is something you actually already kind of have in JavaScript. The cool part is that it allows you to work with objects as sequences and supports reverse carving. So like pipelining and lazy evaluation is something you can find in like RxJS, for example, which for some reason is not mentioned here. But uh, I mean, I guess it's not exactly observable here, but nonetheless, the fact that it allows you to work with objects as sequences and allows you to do reverse carrying is pretty damn cool. So if you are using Rust and you are missing some of those features in JavaScript, definitely check this out. It does add a lot of uh, things from Rust that are pretty handy to JavaScript. And if you never heard about Rust, but if you ever wanted to have a way to iterate over objects in a nice way and a nice functional way, let's put it this way. And uh, yeah, this, this looks pretty great actually. Uh, like Ramda, yeah, it's kind of like Ramda or dash or underscore, but slightly different. So it's, it seems to be like one to one porting of the Rust methods uh, to the JavaScript, which uh, seems to work quite nicely. Uh, I mean, object keys map work perfectly fine, as long as you don't have to be lazy. And as long as you're not working with extremely large objects, right? So as soon as you hit that you either want lazy evaluation or you want something like streams or observables, which just, you know, is more memory efficient, basically. But anyway, there we go. So Ferrum uh, looks quite nice. Um, have you tried Ramda lenses? Ramda lens, I like Ramda lenses is nice, but you know, I just didn't really had a need for them so far. It's like I've, I've, div I've dived into functional programming a lot, but I ended up using slices of it in combination with object oriented programming within the JavaScript. I found that this is what works best for me. But yeah, it's like this, this is the trade off, right? There can be like, they, they are really powerful, but it takes a lot of time to properly set everything up. And in my cases, at least majority of time is just not worth it. <laughs> but you know, that's, that's basically use case dependent. Anyway, continuing, we got Paray, I'm like, honestly, I don't know how to read that, but it's basically promisified array uh, primitive that is compatible with normal array, which is handy, and then comes with uh, a sync method support. So it's basically you just wrap your array in Pray, and then you can await uh, map a sync, sort a sync, uh, reduce a sync. I'm not entirely sure what would be the use cases for that and why you couldn't just map to promises and then do await promise all, but maybe you do and then yeah, do check it out. It seems nicely written with tests and everything. So maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Uh, it does do the sorting in the web worker. Um, I mean, it's a sync, so I assume it just wraps everything into promises. It doesn't say anything about web workers. I assume it's just, you know, promisification and handling those promises correctly. Uh, but we can have a quick look, I guess. Uh, pray promise um, to reduce the sync. Yeah, it just basically wraps them in promises and chains them correctly. So there you go. Um, no, 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 like you literally just use promises, right? So you just return a promise every time and uh, that's it. You don't have to use any timeouts. You just do new promise and immediately resolve it into value. And if the function that you give it is actually a sync, it will basically executes with whatever a sync is needed, right? Yes, instantly resolve promises if there's just a value and if you pass in a sync function that actually does something synchronous, then like fetch, for example, right? Then it's gonna be waiting for the promise to resolve. So it's super straightforward again. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you don't really, like map doesn't need to allow a sync functions, right? You just do map and then return a promise. And then after you map to array of promises, you just do promise await promise.all and give your array and you're done. So this is kind of my, this is what I typically do. But you know, obviously, if you, if you want that, the concurrency option is indeed nice. I give it that. Yes, Tal, thank you for noticing that that is indeed a nice feature. Uh, so yeah, again, you know, I guess, if you're working a lot with concurrent array processing, and you need concurrency limitations and stuff like this, this seems to be quite nice. And also, yeah, zero dependencies, which is uh, quite handy. So yeah, there you go. Anyway, pray. <laughs> it's, it is ridiculous name, but there we go. Right, continuing, we got diagram, a tool for making node graphs inspired by dependency graphs uh, used mainly for automation services. So this is uh, what you see is what you get kind of tool that allows you to visually build the graphs of things. 
that you can then parse and uh, work upon, right? So it can be like, uh, hey, I can build a, I don't know, workflow that does something like CI workflow with this. Um, yes, this does is, this looks like reminiscent of the Botland editor, uh, but it's more about, you know, like, hey, this is actually the diagram, the user built, here's the data, now do something with it. So sort of the visual part of it, and then you have to, uh, build the logic yourself, essentially, which might be quite handy in some cases. Um, looks like a very nicely written, very nicely made. Has the mini map even, and yeah, looks pretty neat. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Right, next thing we got here is, oh yeah, this is probably one of my favorite ones, Harmony of Spheres. This is a Newtonian N-body gravity simulator written in JavaScript. It is absolutely awesome. So there is a public demo available. Um, I think I have, is my JavaScript permitted? Let me just double check this. So yeah, um, come on, load. There we go. It has a ton of demos here and it, like you literally have the fully simulated Newtonian physics with galaxies and stuff like this. And all of that works in the browser written in JavaScript and it's just mind blowing. Like if you are, have any interest in astronomy basically, do check this one out. It is absolutely awesome. And it's also really cool learning material um, if you are curious. It has like a ton of uh, variety of, you know, in, in the demo variety of data that you can actually just uh, navigate and see how all of that stuff works, which is just, you know, I think I spent like, half an hour clicking on things first time I discovered this. <laughs> it is very cool. So there we go. Okay, next thing we got here is webassembly.sh or webassembly shell, I guess. Uh, this is a demo slash playground from Vasmer. So if you never heard about Vasmer, they build this um, WebAssembly engine thing and uh, they have this VAPM, which is the WebAssembly package manager which allows you to publish and run WebAssembly modules with ease, right? Now the cool thing is of course, WebAssembly works in the browser, right? So what you can do is you can actually go to webassembly.shell, you can find a module you want over here, right? And you can just go lolcat, hello world, right? So you just go, okay, this has to be a string and it will pull that module from, uh, whoops, uh, I guess my, no, it is not blocked. Error opening, hello world. Uh, oh, I guess the, okay. I know that cow say works for sure. There we go. So it will pull the module from the WebAssembly package manager and then execute it right in your browser. And because those modules are WebAssembly, you can run all of them in your browser. I mean, I guess you can also run SQLite, right? So this will, there you go. You can run SQLite in your browser with one freaking command. How awesome is this? Like this is the, um, can I just, uh, uh, no, how do you exit from here now? Control C, there we go. There is no clear command, God damn it. <laughs> um, no, it's not exactly NPM competitor. It's more like it's built specifically for WebAssembly and it's not limited to JavaScript world because you can integrate WebAssembly engines into everything. So essentially it allows you to compile native apps into WebAssembly and then uh, pull them and run them over anything which is like you, for example, you have a duct tape here, which is an embeddable JavaScript engine written in uh, WebAssembly. So we can actually run duct tape and um, now we have a JavaScript engine running within browser within WebAssembly, <laughs> which is absolutely bonkers, but it works. We, I mean, this is just mind blowingly awesome. So if you ever wanted to play around with WebAssembly, do check it out. This is really, really cool. Okay, let me have a quick look at the chat. I saw you posting a question. How many months ago did you cover React Spring? I don't think I actually covered a React Spring on its own. I never did a stream on it. I remember talking about it, uh, it as part of BXJS Weekly, but I've been wanting to do some animations with it. So we might do a separate stream with like fancy animations, maybe for BXJS website. But I never used it, uh, to be honest, in my projects, like just, you know, toying around with it and playing. It is a, it has a very nice API and it's very powerful, but I never built anything production ready basically with it. But yeah, okay. Continuing, we got uplot, an exceptionally fast, tiny time series chart. So this is a um, charting library that is just seven kilobytes 
minified and it is very, very fast. So there is a demo here with 166,000 points that basically loads instantly and allows you to navigate the data without any issues, which is really, really cool. So if you're working with a huge volumes of data and you need a very fast plot chart, um, do check it out. It's actually really nice. Uh, does it use mouse wheel? That's a good question. I know that you can zoom by selecting and zoom out by double clicking, but no, it doesn't seem like zoom wheel works at least with the default demo they have. But I think it, like if they have the zooming, then you should uh, be able to quite easily implement it uh, yourself. Zooming with auto rescale. So, I mean, I guess you just tell it, there is probably a way to say that you want zoom by uh, scroll wheel, right? So it shouldn't be too hard to do anyway. Okay. Not the default feature, so. Okay, and the last thing we got here for the today and, well, actually, yeah, for the demos and for today is the winners of GS 13K Games, which is, again, this is just insane. Uh, JavaScript games in 13 kilobytes, some of those games are freaking incredible. And um, yeah, so this one is really neat. It basically, you have this timer and um, you wait for how do I explain? It's a bit hard to explain. Let me just show you. So basically you get to play a player, right? And then you wait for 13 seconds. You He's live with 13 seconds. And then you play again until you actually reach the exit. And there is like, I don't know how many levels are there because I've played like through five or six, but um, it is insane. Um, did they state the reason why this project won? I mean, I believe that the way they pick the winner is through the jury. So they have like a, a bunch of people who evaluate the projects. And I guess it's just like, you know, how technically complex, how much they like it, how interesting is it? Because it is a game competition, right? So you not only have to be tiny and efficient, but you also have to be fun to play. Otherwise there's no reason to, well, compete in gaming competition. This game is actually really cool. Like the, the way they approach this sort of puzzles is really, really awesome. The ghosts are the mechanic of the game. So you go, you control your first character, right? And then when the time resets, you go back to the start and then you have two ghosts, right? So in this case, you have to do it four times to set those four buttons and only then you can actually reach the exit, which is, uh, I believe there is a way actually to do this faster because there's this fourth, uh, fifth button over there that changes something, but it is, there we go. So we actually can do this in three buttons, but this is just, <laughs> yeah, this, this is crazy. Like all of the top games are just as good. Like if you are curious, do check them out. Majority of them actually have the source code available. Yes. And it's just in 13 kilobytes, which is just mind blowing. All right. Um, yeah, that's basically it from my side. As I said, a super tiny episode this time around. So if you guys have any more questions or suggestions or cool links you want to share, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, then we can just wrap it up here and um, I'll probably stream some video games later this weekend and uh, we're going to finish the BXS website this week. We're nearly there with it. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. Just one of my components for React weighs more than that. <laughs> yes, can relate. I do have some components like this too. <laughs> All right, um, Ador, thank you for following. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. We do this on a weekly basis. So, you know, and there's also development streams uh, now and then. All right, doesn't seem like there's any more questions or suggestions. So let's wrap this up. As usual, you can find all the links mentioned on uh, GitHub and on bxjs.dev. We have the Discord server where we discuss JavaScript and video games. Feel free to join if you have any questions, suggestions, or just want to talk. Uh, there is a Telegram channel that has all the links that I collect over the week if you're curious about the unfiltered stream of stuff that I go through to prepare this. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support, donations, subscriptions, and all that stuff that really means a lot to me. Hope you enjoyed the show and I see you next time. Bye.